Welcome to Sketchy. We take all the super complex stuff you need to learn and turn them into memorable visual stories packed full of everything you need to know on test day. Click the link in the corner or description to try for free for seven days. Now let's get to it. Welcome to the Protein Playground, where youthful laughter is abundant, and in true Sketchyland fashion, so are lawsuits. In this sketch, we'll be reviewing protein structure and function at the hottest attraction at the Amino Zoo. And we mean that literally. You'll see. Proteins are an integral part of our everyday functioning. In fact, pretty much everything that happens in any organism's body happens because of proteins. But how can a single molecule do so many things? Well, proteins are actually really varied. Each kind of protein has its own unique structure. And this is really important because a protein's structure determines its function. Now, let's jump into how the different levels of structure allow proteins to accomplish such a wide variety of functions. First, let's get started with the primary structure of proteins. We've represented primary structure with this section of the playground for first, I mean, primary graders. The primary structure of a protein refers to the linear chain of amino acids that is stabilized by covalent peptide bonds, hence the name polypeptide. Each protein has a unique primary structure, or sequence of amino acids, and this unique sequence leads to the unique polypeptide folds that determine how the protein functions. You can see that on the primary grade bridge, there are many different chains on the bridge to represent that each protein is made up of a different chain of amino acids. Now, you might have noticed that I said the primary structure influences how a protein folds. That's higher level stuff. So we're going to hop on over to the secondary grade section to learn about secondary structure. The polypeptide backbone is flexible, which allows proteins to fold in several different ways. Folds that occur between nearby amino acids make up the secondary structure of proteins. While polypeptide chains can fold in hundreds of thousands of ways, there are two types of folding patterns common within proteins. These types also form as repeating patterns in the polypeptide. These are the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. First, check out this slide. It represents an alpha helix. The alpha helix pattern looks like a helix or like a super awesome slide that anyone over four foot eight would get stuck in. And I'm definitely not speaking from experience. Now, if you're one of the lucky kids who can go down that slide over and over again without your mom having to tug you out by the ankles, you're gonna need to take the stairs to get back up there. And what do you know? These stairs look just like a beta pleated sheet, the second secondary folding pattern. These patterns are common because they tend to form when a hydrogen bond connects the carbonyl and amino groups on the polypeptide backbone. These hydrogen bonds stabilize the secondary structures. And this leads us to the section for our tertiary graders, which means we'll be looking at tertiary protein structure. Recall that each amino acid has its own chemical properties that are attributed to its side chains. Some amino acids are polar and some are nonpolar. Of the polar amino acids, some are negative, some are positive, and some are polar but not charged. Up until now, the side chains were just hanging out there with nothing to do. Well, this is where they're put to work. The tertiary structure is what makes up the folded protein structure. By this point, the polypeptide backbone's primary structure has folded into the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets, along with a few other types of secondary interactions. What happens next is that our folded proteins fold up even more because of interactions that occur between the R groups that hang off of the polypeptide backbone. These interacting tertiary graders represent the R group interactions that contribute to tertiary structures. Common R group interactions include hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, van der Waals attractions, salt bridges, or electrostatic bonds, and an interesting thing that happens with the amino acids that have nonpolar hydrophobic side chains. This student is wearing a hydrogen helmet and climbing up the negative rungs of this ladder to represent hydrogen bonds. These plus and minus sign ladders represent the ionic bonds that form between positive and negative atoms in R groups. If you look over to the slide, you'll see that this tertiary grater has staticky hair to represent electrostatic bonds or salt bridges. And remember those hydrophobic side chains we just mentioned? This tertiary grater is neatly arranging his hydrophobic desert toys. 
This is to represent that hydrophobic tertiary structure interactions lower molecular disorder or entropy. Hydrophobic side chains tend to group together on the inside of the protein because this arrangement is more stable and thus lowers entropy. This leaves the polar and charged hydrophilic side chains exposed. Those exposed hydrophilic R groups are free to bond to other polar molecules or make hydrogen bonds with water. When these external groups interact with water molecules, they form what's known as a solvation layer. This water loving tertiary grater interacting with the water represents the hydrophilic interactions that form the solvation layer. But what about covalent bonds? Well, there's really only one kind of covalent bond involved in the tertiary structure, the disulfide bond. Disulfide bonds form when the sulfurs of two cysteines link, forming the strongest bond in the tertiary structure. These curvy monkey bars are shaped like an S to symbolize disulfide bonds in the tertiary structure. You know, because they form between sulfurs. You bet a tertiary grater is going to have to be pretty strong to get across there. As strong as a covalent bond, some might say. Now, it might sound like the tertiary structure is the highest you can go, which is true, sometimes. But sometimes, proteins are made up of multiple subunits, composed of separate polypeptide chains. This conglomeration of polypeptides makes up the quaternary structure, which takes us to the quaternary grade section. These subunits are held together using the same kinds of weak bonds that are involved in the tertiary structure, the main thing to remember here is that the tertiary structure refers to the 3D structure of the single polypeptide chain, while the quaternary structure refers to the 3D structure of multiple interacting polypeptide chain complexes. You can see that in the quaternary grade section of the protein playground, there's a whole nother place structure. And while you can't see it, take my word that it's got its very own chains and stairs and helical slides and R stabilizers and bonding kiddos. It's connected to our protein play structure to remind you of quaternary structure. We've spent all this time talking about proteins coming together, but let's talk about their destruction. <clears throat> this process is called denaturation and involves breaking down the bonds that hold the folds of the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. A denatured protein may stay permanently unfolded or it may refold later on. This all depends on the method that's used to denature it. Proteins typically only function well in a narrow range of temperatures. One way to break down the bonds within proteins is to add heat. Like, say, by igniting the playground. And that's why Sketchy Land has as many lawyers as it has attractions. More, actually. Well, no need to worry too much about that. It's not like kids' lives are in danger or anything. So back to proteins. Heat can disrupt hydrophobic interactions and hydrogen bonds, causing the bonds to break. Think about when you fry an egg. When the egg turns white, it has been denatured. It is unlikely that a protein can be refolded after. Kind of like how you can't unfry an egg. Proteins that are denatured by other means can sometimes be refolded and become functional again. When proteins are denatured by a solvent, denaturation can be reversed once the solvent is removed. These spray bottles of solvent next to a temporary close sign are here to remind us that denaturation by solvents is temporary. Common solvents that denature proteins include alcohol, acids and bases, and heavy metal salts, which are all great things to leave sitting around a playground in a fun spray bottle. Yep, nothing to see here. Okay, I think we'd be wise to call it quits before sketchy land gets any sketchier. But first, let's do one last check of this protein playground. Maybe put some metaphorical or literal fires out before we're slapped with another suit? The primary structure of a protein consists of a chain of amino acids connected by polypeptide bonds. Secondary structure involves the folding of amino acids that are nearby to each other. Alpha helices are common in the secondary structure as are beta pleated sheets. Tertiary structure is the folding of an entire polypeptide due to R group interactions. These interactions include electrostatic bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, van der Waals attractions, and disulfide bonds. 
When proteins fold into their tertiary structure, hydrophobic side chains congregate inside the folds, lowering entropy in the protein. This leaves hydrophilic side chains on the outside of the polypeptide, where they interact with water to form the solvation layer. Some proteins are made up of multiple subunits. These subunits are held together by weak bonds, forming the quaternary structure. Denaturation occurs when the secondary, tertiary, and or quaternary structure of a protein breaks down and the protein stops functioning. Heat often denatures proteins permanently, while solvents like alcohol, acids and bases, and heavy metal salts only denature proteins temporarily. Well, the protein playground sure ignited my interest in protein structure, but I'm gonna head out before anything else goes up in flames. We won't tell you what happened to the quinary graders.